this time on Bobar Garage. We take this 1978 K5 Blazer and get it back on the road in just about a weekend. So my mom's got a winter driver for the snowy days ahead. Welcome back everybody to Pole Barn Garage. I'm in a different garage today. And that's because my mom's 1978 Blazer locked up last week and mysteriously all the oil disappeared in it after a certain Gomer pile touched it. We need to swap the motor out of this because this is their only winter driver. It's the only four wheel drive they got. And uh, they need this old girl. So let's try to get this knocked out this weekend. And uh, this is a video of necessity. Here's a real quick overview of what we're doing here today. So dad went on eBay and purchased the cheapest small block Chevy reman engine you can find. Uh, but it comes with a hell of a good warranty. I think it's ATK that probably remans it, but uh, sold through engines direct. And you know what? It looks pretty dang good. Um, that's a no questions asked warranty for like a year. So what we're replacing is a 400 Chevy but the Blazer is a 78 model uh, that Dad's just been kind of working on here and there. And, you know, it's a pretty nice truck. Sorry, the lighting's kind of rough, but I don't know. It's a nice old truck, and it needs to run like it looks. We got to yank this out. Small block Chevy and a square body? I mean, come on. How hard can it be? First step is going to be to pull this hood off. And since I'm working solo... Throw something up here to try to protect the windshield. You know, we actually care about this one, which is unusual on this channel. I will grant you. Let me get nervous. I'm going to touch nice things. And just let her kind of rock up on the hinges like that. Ah, not a lot of headroom in here. Might have done that a time or two. Let's yank the battery and start removing the radiator, drain the coolant, you know, take off all the ancillary stuff so we can get down to the bell housing bolts, torque converter bolts, et cetera. Well, the pitcock is broke off, so that's nice. Looks like we're dumping the lower hose, which always makes for a good time. Oh boy, that's gonna blow. I got that lined up right. Ah, oh, fuck. Uh, I think we at least minimalize the damage. That cool, it looks terrible. Get those off. Let's get those out of the way. And then yank it. Oh, that's gone forever. To save like the intake distributor, pull carburetor off of it. Get her stripped down. Then we can really get on. Pro tip for you: when you're pulling a clutch fan, they can be kind of a bear because of the, uh, you know, clutch. You'll see, like, when you just try to loosen them, it turns the whole damn thing, right? So what you can do is either wedge a screwdriver in there, or just kind of put a little pressure on the belt. Ah, there. It's going to do one of two things. It's going to roll the motor over or you'll break the nut loose. And well, we're not rolling this one over. The coolant coming out of this looks kind of like mud. That's in good shape. She got wounded pretty bad, I think. That's kind of how I'm going to be doing this one. So not a lot to say. And, you know, and I think of something that might be useful for you doing this at home, especially young guys with a pickup and they're trying to swap a motor. You know, you can... Use this as a little bit of a primer, you know. They tend to rust solid to the water pump. There we go. See, you put a little bit of grease on there, or oil, when you put it back together, you won't have that problem. The other kind of tip I got, anytime I take a bolt or a nut off of something that can thread back on easily and stay on that component, like these nuts on the water pump, I'll start all the nuts on the water pump and keep them there. Uh, that way I don't lose them because, well, I'm a lot less likely to lose the water pump than the nuts, although not impossible. You take belts off and stuff like that, 
just get a little masking tape handy and just make a note of it. Just make a loop out of the masking tape. And like this is the power steering belt. So I'll just write PS on there. Not postscript, PS. Power steering. And that is my rendition of power steer of a P and an S, you see. I fantastic handwriting. When it's someone else's car, try to try to stay organized. Alright, if this is my stuff, <laughs> oh wait. Just I'm just dumping it in a pile, I'll figure it out later. I'm going about this all wrong. Normally I, you know, wait to make the mess makers until I'm done under the car, but you know. Not this time. That is an original lower radiator hose. It has GM stamped on it. Oh, oh dude. That's rough. Look at the rust in there. Somebody has been running a lot of water. This water pump off, leaving the accessories and stuff on there. Oh, right on the other side of my bucket. God damn it. See how bad this is glued on. Not too bad. Cleaned up. Do as I can with a brush real quick. Not shooting for a show of quality here, but just better. Everything just goes back together better if it's clean and painted. Go ahead and get these all rebuilt. New, brand new. And now we have the downside to truck life, which is it's very deep in here. The engine is. Yeah. But once you're in, it's not too bad. It's just the getting in, you know. Well, that was that was really tight. That was exceptionally tight. You're not supposed to be. Uh, you, uh, come on. Now come off of it. That'd be super killer. No, no, you really don't want to do that. Do you? Do you son of a bitch. Oh, you, you, uh, you, no, 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 no. No, nope, those are gone forever. Please pull the distributor along in here. Chevy with an HEI, you just about need a distributor wrench. Yeah, it's starting to get a little warm in here. Having a heater is nice. Be gone! Yuck. Oh my goodness. This thing's going to be really interesting inside. <laughs> what we got here is just your standard GM HEI distributor. What you want to check for on these is just the end play is not that big of a deal. You just want to grab it here and kind of try to wiggle it side to side. There's just a bushing in there. Sometimes they wear out. Dude, I don't know what happened to this thing, but it's pretty messed up. Well, I got this out. This thing had kind of an intermittent misfire problem. It's often the culprit there is the mechanical advance, but let's... Let's take a gander there, and yep, it's pretty rusty. Well, it works. A little sloppy, yeah. Centrifugal advance, so engine spinning, these weights sling out, which then moves this plate here, which gives you yeah, about 20 degrees of spark advance. It looks okay to me. Got the one size fits some wrench here to try to get this booster i put it off as long as I can. Now I get to lay in my filth. And try to take the fuel pump hoses off. These are always fun on these. Especially when stupid people work on them and point the hoses, or and point the clamps facing down, which is great. Why would you put them facing up where you can get to them? Why? I mean, no, it needs to be a challenge. How many chromosomes do these people have? I don't know. Look. All you gotta do is point the hose clamp this way so you can get to it, not directly into the cross member. But, you know, hey, we all make mistakes. Some of us, you know, more than others. Yeah. Ah. You gonna, how much you gonna puke? Not too much. Now to yank the fuel pump to get to the motor mount bolt on this side, and of course, Oh yeah, of course. Can't do that. What was I thinking? All right. And we'll need the fuel pump for the new engine. Anyway. Oh look, it's peeing everywhere. Great. Just go ahead. Let yourself go. Have a good time. Yeah. That's an old fuel pump. Like maybe an original fuel pump. And we are gonna need to save the fuel pump plate here, which 
most likely means we also need the push rod out of it. So it's pretty easy to do on these. You just take these two bolts out. That should just pop off. Ha ha. There, like that. Up in here is a push rod. This fella right here. And that's what drives the fuel pump. We'll throw this over in our getting rebuilt pile here. There, look, it's brand new. We even got silver parts getting rebuilt right here. This big old thing right here is the oil pressure sensor. It's got this funny little adapter on it, which is pretty nice. Wow, that was finger tight. But you, you need that little adapter to get around an HEI distributor usually. And how these work is oil goes in that little hole there, which is why I just sprayed it out with brake clean. Oil goes in there and it pushes on a diaphragm. And there's a little spring in here and whenever the diaphragm gets pushed, 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 there's power going here. And so this just measures resistance. So as the spring gets tighter, resistance gets higher, which makes your gauge work. And some of them work the other way around where looser makes them uh, work the gauge but basically oil in there baffle just pushing 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 and you know it's just measuring resistance simple as that and one of the last things we're going to do up here is take the headers off try to get the top two at least bell housing bolts out and then we're going to crawl under it and take out the torque converter bolts and the remaining four bell housing bolts two motor mount bolts and we're ready to yank Paint something round or weird shape. A pair of ice grips is the third set of hands you always needed. Yeah, a new motor ought to look like a new motor, I figured. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and pull the spark plugs out of this just to make my life a little bit easier when uh, I get under there and have to roll the motor over to get the torque converter bolts out. It is seized, but it will still roll, barely, so we need all the help we can get to try to roll this thing over. Just one revolution is all it's got to do. Now we got five out of six bell housing bolts out of there. Starter's unwired. Got to drop the starter, get that last bell housing bolt, torque converter bolts, motor mount bolts. But check out these plugs. Holy cow. <laughs> not looking not looking real sharp. On these trucks, you got braces that go from the inspection cover up to the motor mount on that side, and I think a bell housing bolt on this one. In keeping with our theme of making this an instructional video, have you ever wondered what the knurls are for on a starter bolt? See, the hole in this end where the bolt goes is bigger. You see, the hole up here is smaller. See how it doesn't really want to go in there? These knurls, when you put the bolt in like this, those knurls are holding the bolt still up here. And that's going to keep the top half of the starter from rocking. You need that extra little knurl there to support that. Otherwise, you'll end up bending bolts, breaking them. I've seen it happen. Um, so if you keep chewing up, uh, you know, your flywheel and, uh, or killing starters, make sure you got bolts in. You should really replace these every time you put a starter on. Let's see if she's going to play nice or not. My money's on no. Oh boy. Ugh. Damn. So they took this to a Gomer pile shop and, uh, he put a flex plate on it a week before the engine blew up. It's crazy how that worked. That dude needs to dial back his torque wrench about... 100 pounds, but we're close. I can almost smell the finish line. But let's see if she'll even turn over for us with a breaker bar. Ah, oh, barely. Oh, boy, she sees bad. Glad we pulled the plugs out. It'll probably just save our ass. Oh. All right, I can see the next one coming around. There it is. Starting to roll over. A little. Well, I just said it was going to roll over easier. Oh. Yeah, that's bad. Are you going to 
You gonna let go any time today? No. No, you're not. Motor mounts on a Chevy are stupid easy. Just a bolt and a nut, clamshell style, both sides. Okay, come on now. Yes, it was pretty tight. La la la. Old fashioned way. Jeez almighty. What the hell? Goodness. Well, she's pretty well ready for plucking now. Got both those out. Other than that wiring back there, there's a weird wire going all the way to the back into that starter loom there. I don't think we need to mess with it though, but if we do, I'll figure that out. But other than that, I think we're ready to go. Got the trans supported with a jack. Got the cherry picker hooked up. And I lost the uh, jack or upper thingy for it, so this breaker bar will work just fine. And we're just gonna try to lift. And since we're leaving the trans in place, we're gonna come up as high as we can. And jerk. I did it, and it's peeping. Of course it's peeping. Uh, right there. She's free. And the transmission is where it should be, so when we put the new one in, it shouldn't be too tough. Now, one thing I've had to do on these in the past is flatten the front tires to get it over the uh, core support. We'll see if we got to do that here. One big empty engine. Hopefully I didn't bend those tranny lines too bad. I don't think I did though. And one gnarly little small block. I just kind of had a duh moment. Can't use the balancer off of this 400 on that 350 uh, because it's externally balanced. The, the, the damper, that is an actual balancer, not a vibration damper. So I had to order one of those in. Hopefully it'll be here tomorrow. Uh, in the meantime, what we need to do is, I was going to put it on the engine stand, but while I brought an engine stand, I did not bring bolts. And so I guess we'll just work on it floating in the air, which is fine. All we got to really pull is the motor mounts, and we'll pull the intake off of it. And we need that harmonic balancer bolt. So I think we're pretty much done with this thing. If I recall, these braces are side specific, so I'm just going to mark these mounts with a P and a D for passenger and driver. Gotta zip this temp center out the side and I think we're done with this thing. Well, I think I got dad talked into just buying a new Edelbrock intake for it, which is probably the right way to go anyway. New Edelbrock intake, new Edelbrock carb. She should be a good little runner. Now this thing is not really anything special. It's just kind of a run-of-the-mill small block. It's like a 195 horse or some 250 horse with a four barrel. I don't know. Does it matter? No, not really. It's just going to move this truck around and uh, it'll do that just fine. The engine came with a gasket set. So you got to put your little fuel pump adapter thingy ba bobber 10,000 on here. All I do is whatever I'm bolting on, that's what gets the silicone. Unless it's super pitted or something. And this is not, it looks nice. And I'm just going to put a really thin layer of silicone around this and my gasket up on here just set it on there and that's basically just going to serve to hold the gasket in place while i bolt this on and just pretty lightly snug it down no need to go hog wild here then we're going to take 
the bolt that plugs this hole right here, this guy. And what we're going to do is since it's sealing on the threads, is we're just going to take some Teflon tape and just wrap these threads with a layer of Teflon tape. That way the oil won't get by it, theoretically. It's not pressurized oil, so it really shouldn't be an issue, but I know my luck, and uh, that means a brand new engine will probably get all, all kinds of gnarly looking. Hold it up, and then once it hits the low side of the eccentric, it should just start moving up. Okay, moving yet. Come on, brand new engine. Yeah, it'd probably be better to twist on a flywheel bolt instead of this. Gotta move that eccentric up a little bit. See this? Warranty people? Zinc for a flat tap at cam. You got nothing to bitch about. Ta da! Look at there. Five quarts of rotella. I'd like to prime it, but we can't do that until, until we get an oil filter on it. To make sure it's on top dead center. No intake on it, just make sure both of these valves are closed. So right now there's no tension on either valve, which means they're closed, which means it's on top dead center. And toss the water pump on. Try to dress it before we throw it in. I thought I remembered that one of the water pump bolt holes goes into a water jacket. It is this one right here. So you gotta put some Teflon tape on that one or just be safe and throw it on all. Gotta pull this plug out of the side of the head they put. Hopefully this will thread in. Yeah, it will. It's now the next day, and here's what we ended up with. This is an Edelbrock EPS intake, Performer EPS. That's for the early small blocks. And I've used these before. I really, really like them. Uh, they're a good, solid, budget intake. 190 bucks right off the shelf at O'Reilly. So, you know, pretty cheap. And they work good. I've got one on my vet. Good for fuel mileage and mid-range power. But, you can see, with these kind of cheapy valve covers, we're gonna have to pull a valve cover to put the intake on because it won't let it sit. Well, here's what we got for cylinder heads. Looks like uh, 8998998, pretty uh, generic truck head, I believe. Uh, something that's uh, often overlooked is putting the exhaust crossover restrictor gasket in place on Chevy engines the center port here is an exhaust most engines have at least one of them blocked like i just looked at it for a half ton chevy 350 and 78 and they had both of them blocked off not blocked but restricted you know if you have them wide open it'll warm up a little bit better in the winter time but otherwise you don't really need them and you know the less heat you got underneath the carburetor pretty much Generally, the better it's going to run, and you're not going to be, you know, vapor locking and stuff like that. So put these two halves together, it's got little tabs on it. And then you put the two halves in here, like so, like that. Get a pair of needle nose in here, crimp those tabs over, and then put one restricted intake gas. Somebody went a little aggressive when they uh, tightened the valve covers down on this. They smushed this one down so hard that. I can't get the gasket to sit in there, so we'll just take this valve cover off too, just to make sure we don't run into any problems. Alright, well I think we're pretty much ready to throw the intake on here, make sure everything's clean. And let's just goop our china walls up with about a 3 8 bead of goop. Take a little silicone. You don't need it around anything except for the water jackets. That's going to help hold the gasket in place while we install it. Center two holes go right into push rods, so you got to make sure not to use a long bolt on these. Pop this on here, make sure it splooshes. Front looks okay. Back looks okay. Kind of squeezed out the silicone. Trim up this kick down cable bracket because it doesn't quite clear the hump on this thing. Just cut the middle of it out. This clears now, so theoretically bolt it off. And these center bolts here, they go right into oil. And you're not gonna like have a leak or nothing if you don't uh, put anything on them, but just dab a little bit of silicone onto them. Just a little RTV on the threads, just on these center four and just put them in like normal and that's gonna keep your 
intake from getting all nasty looking and stuff. Because it will, trust me. And when you're tightening something down, intake, cylinder head, crankshaft, anything, always start in the middle and work your way up. And snug everything first, and then go back and get it tight. Bounce around and you get them all thrown down. You'll probably try to loosen back up on you as you tighten more of them. All right. I just need a regular box wrench for these middle ones, probably. But see, they loosened right up as I tighten the outside ones. These inside ones got super loose. Torqued. Torqued. The ligaments in your wrist pop, you know it's torqued. I'm going to rob this one out of here. So you can have a heater. Notice how that's a little hole, it's restrictive. And that's because this is a supply side, so it doesn't push out too much or something. I don't know. Now, if you work for Engines Direct, you might tell, uh, you know, your guys to dial back the torque wrench about 300 newton meters. So look at these. That's not how you put a steel valve cover on. That one's really, really, really screwed. <laughs> they even bent the uh, spreader thing. Oh, I just went ahead and completely refurbished this distributor. But it's brand new. And on a Chevy, you point number one at the left rear carb stud. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We need to prime this engine. It's new. So we gotta put the oil pressure sender in it, and we gotta lift it up just so we can put a oil filter on it. Otherwise, when we go to prime this thing, it's gonna spray oil everywhere. And this guy will just thread in and just try to make sure it's pointing back and away from the distributor. This is what you do with snap-on tools. Yeah, now you got to make an oil pump primer. Huh. It's kind of an ad for snap-on. <laughs> <laughs> got it tough looking up. Here's what I got here. So. Chevy rotates clockwise, so if you want it to turn to the right, and well, I guess I do need a flash so I can see the oil. So if we look down in there, you should see pressure feeding the rear camber. Lots of oil. Vacuum advance can goes over here on the passenger side on this one. And we want to shoot our rotor right at the back of that carb stud, so number one lands over there. And that is pretty freaking close, completely by mistake. And perfect. Now you use a screwdriver, turn that oil pump, and just kind of turned it back a little bit, shoots right where we want it. Your new harmonic balancer or any harmonic balancer. Put some on the outside of it so it doesn't tear the seal up, and some on the inside of it so it goes on a little easier. A little bit of oil. Just line the teeth, the key up. And you don't want to pound these on. I'll show you how to put it on, but but you can get them started with a dead blow. So this is a Harbor Freight harmonic balancer installer polar thing slash probably steering wheels and everything else and you just put this thing in here but obviously that doesn't thread in so it comes with all these adapters tighten that in now this thing is threaded on the inside and you can just thread it onto your adapter in there it shouldn't be too hard it should go on pretty smooth now it's you rock Maybe it's supposed to, maybe I'm supposed to use this thing <laughs> to spread it out. Torque, that flex plate don't fit. It, or it does fit, but it don't seat nicely. We could probably force it, but I hate to. Well, I'm going to just put a couple of bolts in to hold it there until you beat it on. Yeah. I just 
these things crack so easy. Christ, that's a press fit. Still got no emery cloth. Get some sandpaper. We try to take the edge off of this. This side's where it needs to be pulled in. It's on there now. Not a fan, but it's on there. A little blue Loctite on these. Just a dab is all you need. I'm trying to get the motor in. You gotta get that bell housing lined up. You guys probably can't hardly see, but try to get a bolt stuck in there and then we'll know the transmission's in the right spot. Now, yeah, we'll, leave it, yeah, leave it hooked up. I'm sure we'll have to wiggle it to get the mounts in. But I think the trans went all the way up here, so I can see a little bit of a gap. It's all these funny looking nails down here. Everything underneath is done. Uh, torque converter bolts are in, all the bell housing bolts are in. The inspection cover is bolted on, the starter is bolted on. Now we are pretty much left with the piddly stuff up top. Fuel lines, headers, power steering pump, belts, hoses, radiator, distributor cap, carburetor will be here Tuesday. Uh, tranny lines, pretty minor stuff really. I'm going to try to get as much done as I can tonight and then we will see where we go from there. Kind of got distracted, kept working off camera. And, uh, well, there's even more of it put in here. The headers are totally tightened up. The accessories are on tight. Uh... Pretty much, we even got one heater hose on, and the battery sitting in it. Looking at distributor cap, wire it, uh, radiator, hoses, carburetor. That's pretty much it. We are we're in the home stretch. Came back out here for another night. I have a whole lot of time tonight, but came out just to box up the old engines back in the crate. I figured I'd go ahead and throw this distributor cap on it. This is actually off of the Torino. It had one of these GM HEI things in it. And Deb put a small cap in it, so it looks a lot nicer. Gonna throw that on here, and maybe try to get it wired up, or throw the plugs in it at least, and I'll call it a night, and I'll come back out tomorrow, and we'll wrap it up. Here's the flavor of spark plug we've got today. It's a Motorcraft plug for a Ford. Why? Because they were the cheapest ones, of course. So you know, that's uh, that's the way to do it. And you know what? It, it's it's a freaking spark plug. Okay, there. They're all about the same. Uh, we just want to make sure these are gapped halfway correct. Looks like they're about 40. That's fine. 40 to 50, anywhere in there is good enough for HEI. For all you newcomers from Mortski Repair and Junkyard Digs, among others, welcome aboard. This isn't exactly the typical pole bar garage, but uh, it is kind of two car garage. Where are these babies made at, you think? Mexico. Better than China, at least I matched the engine. And she's wired for sound now. But 18436572, and if you don't have that memorized by heart, it's probably time to go back to Dave Freiberger's school of firing order themed apparel. Tell him I said that. Anyway, I'm done for the night. I'm tired. Gotta get up 5 a.m., hit the old gridiron. You know, a 40 hour week for a living, just like Alabama said. Back at it again. Hopefully today's our last day of working on this thing. We got a brand new carburetor over here in this Speedway box. And we'll be good to go with that. Um, what's next? I think we throw the carb on. Plumb that. Radiator, trans lines, fan, fan shroud, done. Right? That easy. <laughs> Never. Here's our flavor of carburetor today. Edelbrock 1406. Pretty basic. Electric choke. Got it from Speedway in a little bundle that came with a fuel filter and a carb stud kit. Pretty cool. But, uh, you know, these are pretty idiot-proof carburetors that run right out of the box. And that's really what we were shooting for. I'd say if you want max performance, probably not the carburetor for you. But if you want something that just starts every time, you don't got to touch it for, like, decades, pretty good carb. Pretty good carb. There's a couple of things you want to do before you throw the carb on. 
and it all comes in this little baggie here. Carb stud. We can go ahead and plug in our electric choke wire. We'll have to go find somewhere to grab power from for it. But you want to ground the choke on these. What I usually do is do something you're probably not supposed to, but I usually just plug them in and then I just run them right up to one of the carb bowl bolts. And uh, yeah, it's always worked for me. These are a T25 Torx head. So just use a nut driver. You don't want to go crazy here. And we'll just put it right here. So first thing we're going to do is put the uh, carb set in. Don't gorilla these in now. All you'll do is tear up your intake, especially a brand spanking new one like this. Look at all the shiny goodness on this thing. Don't drop stuff down that hole now. Then you've got big problems. Big problems. You know, for the ones that are a little sticky, I just take my vice grips, carefully place them on the shanked part of the stud, and just lightly twist them in. No hogging now. There we go. Sometimes if you can use the inside hole, you can put this little pin here on it, and it'll kind of help to keep your throttle linkage from shifting about. But Honestly, this whole thing actually fits on here just fine. So, you know, this, just that extra bit here, even though it's not bolted down, we'll keep that from trying to pivot. Tighten her down. Get her all tightened down, then we'll worry about hoses and linkage, which we're going to have to get a little creative with. So we're going to hook up our vacuum advance line. Vacuum advance generally goes to ported vacuum, unless you need it to pull in all the time, then you can throw it on the... Uh, manifold vacuum. Easy way to tell what is ported vacuum and what is manifold vacuum. Ported vacuum is always higher on the body of the carburetor. Manifold vacuum is right down on the bottom right next to the manifold. They don't provide you any carb linkage stuff. Gotta buy all that separate of course. And then on the back here, see that big old hole? Yeah, that's for a, uh, you know, vacuum booster for a 3 8 nipple to stick out of. And uh, Usually, they used to come just plugged off, and you could take the plug out if you didn't want it. Turns out this is how you do it. The uh, Quadrajet has this thing, this little flare fitting adapter, flare to pipe or something, in the back of it. And this threads right into the Edelbrock. And then I can use the original booster line. Maybe even run it through its factory route. That would be cool. No vacuum leaks. No leaks. No leaks. I'm always losing things. Is anybody else always losing things? I'm all, it was forever losing everything. If it ain't bolted down to the ground, I'd forget about it. It's gone. I need to straddle it and bend and tweak and force and shove and... Why am I doing this? Why don't I just run a little bit of extra rubber hose? Nope, it's gotta be nice for mom. Gotta, gotta undo some of my usual hackery. See, you really can't half-ass things until you know how to whole ass them, you know what I mean? So, every now and then I like to, you know, I like to freshen up on my not half-ass literally everything. And there's our throttle linkage. It's bolted down here. It's snug. It ain't moving nowhere. Now what we gotta do is aim for this hole right here. Try to get something in there. And likewise for the kickdown cable. So this bottom hole is for the kickdown. And I robbed the thingy off of the quadrajet right here and it doesn't fit <clears throat> so i considered drilling out the hole i don't know i'm just not really into drilling holes in brand new parts if i can avoid it so what i'll do is just use this bolt right here which isn't going to allow it to work it's not going to work on the inside though, it's definitely going to have to go on the outside. But basically, full throttle, it's kicking the, into passing gear. And as long as it does that, we'll be kosher. To secure this, what I'll do is I'm just going to take a nut and thread it on here. And then we slide our kick down cable over that. And we'll put this little die lock nut on here and just start it enough that the nylon will engage. Maybe a little extra, just so it doesn't vibrate off. That leaves enough slop in here that this can still kind of pivot and do its thing. 
like it should. Let's throttle linkage up. What I'm gonna do, so you can see this here has got a hole in it. That's got a hole in it. And I don't have anything to hook it up. The thing on the quadrajet is mounted securely. So what I'm gonna do is put a bolt in it, but I'm not gonna do what you think I'm gonna do here. So what I'm gonna do is take this screw here and see if you bolted that into the carb, even if you use two nuts, I don't know if I trust it completely. I think it's still going to eventually work itself loose at the most inopportune time. So what I'm going to do is grind two flats onto this, drill a hole through the middle of it, and then put a cotter key in it. I've done that a hundred times, and it works great. I have this adorable little drill bit. Well, it broke in half, but drilled the hole, so I guess I got nothing to complain about. You gonna come out of there? There you go. Take our new bolt thing here. Found enough to slide through. But down. Ding ding. Looky there. Now we'll take our nut. Tut. Okay. We'll take our nut, tighten it all the way down on there. Maybe using a nylon nut isn't the wisest thing here, but it's the only thing I got. So here we go. Beautiful. Now if we can, it's always nice to fit a washer on it. And then try to fit our cotter key through there. Preferably both halves of it. There we go. Bend it over and boom. One throttle hooker upper 6,000. That's patented. You owe me money if you use that. We're all plumbed here. If you line run it up, kind of off to the side, you know, not ideal, but well, there's not really anywhere else to put it, so that's where it goes. We gotta find a power source for our electric choke. So what I'm gonna do is hook up the battery, make sure it doesn't spontaneously combust. So far, so good. And we're gonna go look for a keyed, key on 12 volt power source. Well here, ignition, how about you, huh? How about you, that looks likely, and it's open. There we go, that's where we'll grab it, right there. We got one extra spade connector right there. It says ignition. I know it's I know it's tough to see, but take my word for it. All right, got a little female spade on here. Come back here light. And we're just gonna hook that up. And now with keyed power on our choke, it will supply voltage to the bimetallic spring inside of that choke housing, and it will slowly expand that spring, thus opening the choke route that a little bit cleaner so it does not get ripped out and go bye-bye. Oh, yeah, just go ahead and bother the rest of that. Oh, yeah, no. One second. Oh, God. Oh, no. Well, I was doing what I thought was a pretty good job of not creating an environmental disaster. But it was, of course, wrong, as usual. Well, she's all in here. I made the right call by putting the fan on first. Still gonna put the top plate on and still gotta tighten up these training lines. So the uh, upper transmission line is a, well, it takes a really special wrench, uh, this one. Yep. Go ahead and fill up the antifreeze. Got the stuff in the gold jug here because uh, it's universal and uh, it was $3 cheaper for a game. Don't know why. That's pretty much my only criteria for buying things, so I would very much like it if you were not peeing on the ground. So far, so good. Yeah, you should always use distilled water when you do this. And you mix your antifreeze, but uh, ah, don't pay no mind to that. It's just big water trying to get you. Actually, it's pretty cloudy looking. They must have some pretty hard water here. Still not peeing. Good sign. Picked up this fancy new timing light just for this. One of the nice dial back ones. I had one, but uh, it died. We'll go ahead and get it set up because that's going to give us a tack to look at. We can kind of see what it's doing. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm assuming the cam isn't broken in in this. And because it's flat tack the cam, it means we're immediately going to need to go to about 2500 RPM and hold it there for about 20 minutes. So it's very important to get this started as quick as possible. So I am going to cheat a little, try to get the fuel pump to pull some fuel. I wish it pulled some gas. 
It's safe to assume I put the distributor in 180 out, which I'm not really sure how. Um, so I'm just gonna pop the distributor out and spin it around. Okay, so I pulled the distributor out, flipped the rotor around. Let's see what happens. Still ain't got no fuel though, probably. Take a little hop for this. It's been a minute since I hit that last, so. There we go. Come on, now if we can just get a little fuel to it. Check this out for old school. Spit back out at me. I saw my grandpa do that on a tractor once. I'm sure it'll work. Didn't give it way too much of this. Yep, that's gonna start a fire. Come on, baby, pull some gas. Well, we're firing, but we ain't getting no fuel, so we gotta do something I don't particularly enjoy. Here's some gas. Pulling a little bit of something. A little bit more. Ugh. All right, well, it's freaking prime now. I'm gonna show you. If you can't blow, suck. Tuh. The only thing I can figure is in these instructions over here, it says to adjust valve flash immediately after firing the engine, which is weird. Why would you need to do that? But I'm wondering if they got them set up like super tight or something or loose to make sure the cam breaks in okay and you got to go back and lash them. So it runs okay at idle, sounds fine. So then it's only when you put it under a load and it kind of clears up and it kind of, you know, you know what I mean? I think, I think it's probably valve flash. Uh, is it, the, the timing marks can't go off. Of that for sure. That's completely out to lunch. It says like 30 degrees of timing. It's not 30 degrees of timing. So it's wired right. That's pretty much what I'm down to. That or a massive vacuum leak that I just, I just don't see, I don't wear, you know, there's nowhere other than the intake. And we were pretty uh, judicious about how we went about that, so. So I was fiddling around and I found two plug wires that were off of the damn thing. And so now I want to check them all, except for it's broiling hot. Ugh, numero five. And Umaro 6 that were off. They're on now. Still kind of runs like um, dog ass. You know, part of me is wondering um, fuel filter draining back, maybe fuel pumps not pumping out enough. It's the label they gave me. <clears throat> and I don't, I, I, like, it's just a small block Chevy. I set them and forget them like 99% of the time. I don't, oh no, <laughs> hey, look at the vacuum port that's wide open. Son of a bitch. It just had everything working against it. Well, let's try to plug that real quick before I run out of time and end up pissing off the whole neighborhood. It's plugged. Let's just see what happened with that. Doesn't sound bad right now. That is Val to me. So we stopped back by here today now, the next day, on like the fifth day in a row. But anyway, I grabbed the cap and coil off of the GTO, the Holy Goat, and just threw it on here just for grins, you know. Because this cap and coil, well, so this cap and coil came from that Torino. And the Torino didn't run very good, but, you know, I figured what the hell. And then this cap and coil was on the Blazer. And you can see that button is totally blasted in there. See how carbon that is? It's gone. And so that's why I used the Torino's coil, because it looked a little better. But take a listen to this. So, I 
think that was the problem. I am going to try to dial this timing in, but it still says it's way advanced. And I know it isn't. Try to put the hood on it. No promises. Go to the other side. You crawl up on there and just kind of scoot it over. Okay, go. All right, come on. You're gonna have to lift up over the hinge. This will be hard. Here, come hold this side. I'll do that. I'm gonna be coming this way. Okay. You get your side in first. Yeah. Let me just do this. Yeah. That way, it's got something holding it. Heavy. Huh? This thing's heavy. Yeah, it is. Cool. She's on. There. Well, I looked to where you see where the old washers were. Oh, yeah. And I just kind of guessed. Off of that. Hello, look at that. Looks fine to me. We got one problem, heater core leaks pretty bad. So that's great. Well, now that it's blisteringly hot, we'll go ahead and check the valves, I guess. I just want to rule that out. It could be that I have too much timing in it since it dieseled a little bit when I shut her down. I'll pull just a hair out of it, but let's at least check one valve and see what it's like. My only thing is, if it was valves, it'd probably sit here and do it while it, you know, while it was just sitting here, it wouldn't necessarily need to be running yeah. and moving to, you know, act that way. It should do it all the time, I would think. Timing could be under a load, but, and valve can too, but, I don't know, they'd have to be pretty, something really weird would have to be going on here. So what we're going to do is probably just check this one valve here and just kind of inspect everything. But I've disconnected the coil. So that whenever he bumps it, you know, the engine won't try to start. What I'm going to do is watch for this exhaust valve to just begin to open. Then I can adjust the intake valve. Bump. I don't see anything wrong with these. And I guess I didn't take into account that those lifters are probably pumped up from running. So I'm backing them off all the way. Let that lifter plunger come all the way up. And now I'm tightening them down and they are actually adjusted quite a bit looser than they were. So I'm going to run this bank and we'll probably run the other side. We'll just see what it runs like. He's throwing the valve cover on this side and then we will run the valves on this side. And I did notice some discrepancies in there. There were some that were uh, pretty damn loose and some that were pretty damn tight. Uh, enough that it would make that big of a difference? I don't know. But I do know that they're all pretty even now, so... Bump. 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 
Bop. Bop. Okay. Now we're going to back this off, take the preload off of it, and reset it until we can just spin it. Let's see if we made any improvements or possibly even deprovements. Shut it off. No bucking, no weird stuff. So it can't be too too far out of whack. Let's just stop by our house and see. Okay. Give her a once over. Plus, I'm out of smokes, so we gotta stop by the house. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> well, there's the sun. Perfect. That's <laughs> yeah. exactly why I put it there. Thanks. Uh, whatever company sent me that. Want more? Found a few issues. One, we got a burn through plug wire right here. And that might explain our little intermittent kind of kick, 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 kick. And uh, also, the power wire for the distributor was, I literally touched it and it just fell out. So I threw a couple zip ties around that, to hold it in. And, because I'm lazy, <laughs> we were maxed out on our advance, so I moved every plug wire counterclockwise one position to kind of give us a little more play. So we're now we're gonna have to try to time it again, but let's see what that did. <laughs> okay, that's too much advance. Okay. Which is good. We weren't able to go that far before, so now we can dial it back until she starts. And generally, on your run-of-the-mill small blocks, that's going to be just fine. Yeah. 
Shuffling those plug wires around seemed to make the difference. And she's she's cool now. I mean, she runs nice, smooth, got good power, no weird stuff going on. I still think it needs a module. Still think it, it obviously needs a set of plug wires. That you know, little tiny stuff like that. But I think as a whole, our engine install was a success. And you know, if somebody had more time than I've had the last couple of days, we could knock this out in a weekend. So. I kind of hope this is just a little encouragement, especially for you younger guys, you know, if you're out there and, you know, you're out hot rodding for your girlfriend on Friday night. Oops, there goes the rod. Well, you know, the in the world is not over, right? You know, granted, we bought a crate engine. You go find some junkyard motor, swap it in here, you're good to go. But remember, you're always going to run into a little BS crap like we've been dealing with for the last day. And... Don't let that discourage you. There's a troubleshooting process for things. Just work your way through it, and you'll probably find it. And when you don't, just sell it to the next sucker. That's going to do it for this video on Pole Barn Garage. Uh, make sure you check out all the other videos if you're new from Mordski Repair, Junkyard Digs, No Nonsense Know How, All Buddies of Mine. Check them out as well. You know, I just had to do this. Mom's ready to go back on the road. She's asleep. Otherwise, I'd have her on and see what she thinks, but I know she'll be happy. So.